This time on the AVB Podcast, we're back here home in Windsor, Ontario at the amazing Edward Hayes Lighting. Thanks to our, our incredible sponsors for having us out here. And I get to hang out with Leo Cormier from the Cancer Bats. What's going on, man? Not so, the Cancer Bats, just Cancer just Bats. Just Cancer Bats. I don't want to commit that we're, fucking error. We're not <laughs> trying to be uh, exclusive. <laughs> you know, we're just part of the flock. <laughs> Just hanging out. Well, this is awesome. I know you're in town today uh, for a show over at the Don Polsky Center. Yeah. Um, oh, but yeah. let's uh, let's start with you the way we start with everybody. I want to hear about the house you grew up in, brothers and sisters, mom and dad, all of all of oh, those okay. details. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, okay. House I grew up in. I was born in Winnipeg. Okay. Uh, originally, um, my dad worked in transportation. Uh, so truck driver or <laughs> he, yeah he didn't drive trucks by the time I was born so okay. that was where we moved around a bunch because he was sort of moving up within the trucking world oh cool so he didn't want to be away from uh, family uh, so then it was like okay so I was a truck driver for 20 years I get it oh okay yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. and um, so that was always like a big like thing was like you know obviously travel and driving and mm-hmm. stuff like that but uh, because my dad was off the road uh, so we moved, not a ton, but we, we moved to Winnipeg because my dad got a job there. Um, and then by the time I was four, we moved back to Southern Ontario. Or we moved, sorry, we moved to Southern Ontario for another job. I think my dad got a job with Pure later at that point. Mm-hmm. But uh, we moved to Newmarket, and then uh, we moved to Kitchener-Waterloo. So I grew up oh. most of my life in Waterloo. Okay. Yeah. Brothers and sisters? I have one older brother. Yeah? Yeah. A musician as well? No, no. no very different. Yeah? Uh, he's a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The punk rock kid with the lawyer brother. Yeah, like lawyer, that. older brother. He's definitely like, uh, not like the money-driven, drives a Beamer lawyer. Right. He, um, he's like super interested in law, like super smart. Uh, so more the nerdy end of law. Mm-hmm. So he actually works for the city of Ottawa. Oh, cool. Uh, as, like, they're kind of, like, one of their legal representatives. So oh, he sweet. currently works for Parks and Rec uh, in that department. Uh, but he also, because there isn't a lot of legal stuff, he just, like, then also does a ton of other stuff, like, for, oh, awesome. like, the, the Parks how, and Rec. How much, you said he was older? Older brother? Yeah, he's four years older. Four years older. How was that growing up? Was there this, this standard? Uh, we got along. Like, we definitely, like, you know, um, we're very different. Right. Like, but we also, you know, that's, like, where we were both, like, into comic books. My brother was really into, like, Dungeons and & Dragons and, like, okay, fantasy cool. and that kind of stuff. So I, like, learned a lot about, like, fantasy and sci-fi. Oh, sweet. But then I was, like, into skateboarding and, you know, punk rock. And so we, like, you know, we definitely got along. We were, like, we we're cool, but we also, like, had our times where we disagreed and fought. So music for you is more, more about the energy than it is about the music almost, I'm guessing. Yeah, and I definitely didn't come from, like, my brother, you know, like, the older hardcore brother right. who, like, showed you the Misfits. Like, mm-hmm. that was never my brother. No. So I got my brother into punk rock, and especially, oh, like, you he, went still, back the other he way. still likes ska and, like, stuff like that. <laughs> nice. And, like, going to fun shows. But, uh, yeah, it was definitely not, like, where my brother was. We I had, like, friends, older brothers who were skateboarding and, like playing us like the misfits and black flag and you started chasing them no but it was just like oh okay i see but i never envied them because those guys were also like burnouts and like <laughs> weird so it was like who are these role models but right you know it's just cool. just kind of cool. caught a fascination with it though with punk or well, with, with with skateboarding is it which skateboarding came, was the big one so it, that it, was did it come thing. before yeah, it like, came before music yeah right? being into like skateboarding snowboarding bmx like mm-hmm. all that kind of like culture was like huge for me. How 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 old were you when you got your first skateboard? When I was my first skateboard, I was probably like five or six. Yeah. Like I definitely got like the the Canadian Tire Gator board. <laughs> right. Like really early days. Like I was just like, this is so cool. Um, because there was that like like eighties like skateboarding was cool. It was right. on TV before it kind of like died off in the nineties. Right. But then by the time it was like going down in the 90s that was when I was like all in that's when you so started I was like Thrasher magazine like all that stuff and then that's where obviously like punk and hardcore started it, it it's it's funny because when you catch when you catch a wave like that on the on the downturn 
it almost requires you to be more fucking like, for lack of a better term, more hardcore, right? Like you've oh, got, like you've yeah, got to yeah, be, yeah. right? Because it is, it's that same <clears throat> thing with punk. It's that same sort of like thing. Even snowboarding, like we were the underdogs. Like we weren't allowed on ski hills. We oh yeah, that's yeah. right. Okay. Like in the '90s, it right. was like it was a very. How old are you? I'm 39. Okay. Yeah. 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 So right. in like yeah in like 1991. When I was like 11 was when I like started getting into like snowboarding and skateboarding, okay. like hard into skateboarding and yeah, understanding yeah. like the culture and all that stuff. See, man, I started, I like, I was like every other kid around that time, right? I fucking, I wasn't going to use this reference. I didn't figure you'd catch it, but you might. Um, I had a Max Hedrum fucking skateboard, oh, okay. right? So yeah. like Canadian tire by the one that had the fucking graphic on the back. Yeah. Or whatever. And they would have the rails and the weird yep. skid. Like plastic <laughs> things, so we would take all those off. <laughs> yeah, see, I didn't get that. But it was like before the ollie, you know. Like it was like before yeah. like that weird transition. So there was older guys that we would see who were doing pressure flips and like weird stalls, but like that was like we were just like pushing around. Yeah, uh, me and my friends. So it wasn't until like I was a little bit older, like 11, 12, Like that was when. It was like, oh, okay, we're going to, like, actually get... Skateboards. Well, you're in a city where you have access to a lot of a lot of people that would be into that stuff, too. Yeah, right? Waterloo was cool to grow up in. Yeah. In in hindsight, like, definitely it, it felt small town at the time mm -hmm. because it was, like, you know, across the street was a farm and, like, it was, like, really rural. Well, you had Toronto to compare it to, right? But we were also right next to St. Jacob's. Like, there was also, like, Mennonites right. in my city. Yeah, you know? yeah. So guess, it was, like, uh, that that sort of weird side. But we had the University of Waterloo, so it was really multicultural. Right. There was lots of really cool stuff going on. We had, like, really good record stores. Mm -hmm. We had actually, like, tons of shows because of the university. Really? So, like, 90s indie rock. Like, CanCon oh, yeah, indie rock was, oh, like, yeah. huge Sure. Uh, in Waterloo. See, that's one of the, and, and lately, uh, it's been, like, the running theme is that the idea of growing up in Windsor, you don't, you're, you're not Canadian here. Because we, yeah. we're exempt from all the CanCon rules, right? Oh, okay. So, yeah, so, like, we're, because of the U.S. markets here, they got exempt from all the CanCon rules. So, like, the Tragically Hip, I learned about way late. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. even, even, you know, Tea Party, their, their, their local band, well, they didn't get any attention here. They got attention up the mm -hmm. highway and then fucking Australia and stuff. Like, it was... Yeah, we used to come to Windsor and go to Detroit for shows, like, when I was, like, a little bit older. Like, by the time I was, like, 18, 19. Yeah. For, like, uh, like hard time and, like, that kind of stuff was happening. But we would go to, like, uh, Detroit to go to, like... The shelter and like sure. to like Mr. Muggs and like that yeah. kind of stuff, like in Ypsilanti. Yeah. Like to go see like Walls of Jericho and like bands nice. like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was sort of like, oh, okay. But we see, were. See, it's funny because growing up here, that's not like a, that's not a trip. That's like a, that's a, yeah, you're, you're just like go going through show. the tunnel. But that's gonna be like a fucking adventure for you guys, right? Yeah, and we didn't do it like I say, like we did it. Like we would more because tons of shows happen in London, Ontario because yeah. of Call the Office. Yeah. So I would go to London, Ontario, or I would go to Guelph. And right. that's actually how I met Jay, who plays in Bats. He's okay. from London. Right. So we've known each other since, like, late 90s. Just showing up to hardcore shows. Just going to hardcore shows. And because there was only, you know, like, 30 of us, mm -hmm. you just kind of became friends. And then the London scene and the Waterloo scene became very close. Okay. Because we were like... Well, it's got a killer music scene. And it was like, we'll come for your hardcore shows. Right. Do you know what I mean? So it was sort of like spoken, unspoken. Like, if you guys put on a show, like if For Dire Life's Sake is going to come and play or like, you know, someone cool, mm -hmm. we'll all come down to make sure that show does well. Right. So it's like no one loses any money. The show will be cool. And then vice versa. They were like, right. oh, if there's something happening in Waterloo or like, like if The Swarm is playing Waterloo, like we'll come right. to that show. It's great though. It was awesome. And it was why we became like such good friends. Mm -hmm. Like with tons of people in that city when did when did music start being because like i know i know just from sort of understanding skateboard culture like punk rock is immediately attached to it like as soon as you get to a skateboard yeah. punk rock's there um when did it become more of a thing you listen more than a thing you listen to instead of become a thing you wanted to do i always like played music though at oh, the same yeah? time yeah okay. so i like played drums um yeah. Since I was 16, 15, 16 was when I got my first kit, mm -hmm. but always wanted to play drums, just like right. didn't have the money. Right. And was just like, oh, this is <clears throat> sick. I'll like play drums. Right. Uh, 
but would spend my money on skateboarding and snowboarding, especially snowboarding. I was like really into snowboarding right. and was like, I'm better at this than skateboarding. So, so it was a focus. Yeah. And then I got a job at a snowboard shop. So oh, it was like, okay, I could actually like see a career. See, that's funny because we were, before we got started the, the podcast, we were talking and, and we'll get to this part of your story, but you were, you were talking about dealing with the, the record label that you deal with. What was, what's the name? Uh, New Damage. New Damage. And how you sort of like would just show up and go and, and sort of ask the questions or whatever. Mm-hmm. That was a thing. That's a thing you've always done, huh? Oh, like that's the thing that I realized was like getting that job when I was 16. Yeah. Uh, was like such a huge, like, like pivotal point. And, like, so many of the things that I learned that I now... Like, I run a clothing brand now. Okay. I, like, you know, basically sell gear is, like, what we do for Cancer Bats. Right. It's, like, running a small business. Mm-hmm. So, it was, like, learning all of these things when I was, like, 16. But at the time, I just was, like, oh, yeah, I'm just selling snowboards. And then I learned how to sell skis and cross-country skis. They sold, like, camping gear and rollerblades. Like, they kind of sold everything. Right. So, I just was, like, learning all this, like small business right. like stuff and I worked for that shop and for other skate shops until I was like 21 yeah but there was if you were there that long then in your run there there was what 12 15 other fucking kids that came into the same shop and didn't end up paying attention to the shit that you paid attention to yes but it's funny because there there was a lot of people at that shop specifically it was called OW Sports okay. there was a lot of people who like ended up doing like other things there was a guy really? in Waterloo who was like he ended up promoting like all these like uh, more specifically like Christian bands but he became like a big like promoter like DIY okay. promoter in Waterloo yep. and like we worked together there was another guy who went on to like actually work in I think the ski industry but uh, yeah it was like like, it was just because, like, they taught us a lot of, like, really good stuff. So you and had they, really good mentors there. Yeah, but in a weird... Yeah, I would say exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at the time, you don't think without it, it being Without it being forced on you, they just made you... Yeah, they were just like, it. we want you to be able to sell tons of stuff and make us lots of money. That's awesome. So it was, like, it was cool. I got paid $7 an hour. It, right. Forever. But you learned But I learned everything. tons. Yeah. But at the time, I was salty because I was just like, man, I'm selling all this stuff. I'm only going to pay this $7 an hour. That's hilarious. If you could go back and talk to that kid, what would you say to him? Oh, I don't even know. I don't, I don't have any regrets, like, in terms of, like, what I did. No, like, I don't know if it would be I a did. regret, but, yeah. Like, Do you know what I mean? I yeah. always think of, like, telling the younger you. Yeah. Because I'm like, oh, that's, like, your trajectory. Like, I'd, I'm, like, there's so many, like, good mistakes that I feel like I made. Right. And, like, good, like, life lessons. That, like, happened in, like, working at that shop. And, like, I, like, drank back then and, like, partied really hard. Right. And so did a lot of people who worked at the shop, too. And I was like, well, that was important. Mm-hmm. Even, like, in that I don't party now. You well, know? And, yeah, like, even even if, if nothing else, when it taught you to fucking show up to work anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? And that there's lots of people that, like, do that. Yeah. That, like, we would just be, like, hungover, like, drinking Mike's Hard Lemonade. <laughs> Like right. at the ski shop on a Sunday <laughs> was like the reality of it and the same with like the, the skate shop when I worked there right um, was like a lot of like partying but then yeah just kind of like navigating my way through that and right. just being like okay well what do I actually want to do so when does so when does the band stuff start band stuff was kind of always going so I started nobody needed a drummer because there was lots of drummers okay so I started singing in a like punk band um, I think by the time I was 17. Okay. So I was learning how to play drums, was really into drums. And then, like, my friend's band needed a singer, and he heard me, like, singing at a Goldfinger show. Okay, that we nice. Went to. Um, and I was just, like, singing along to, like, no effects that they were playing in between, and I was, like, goofing around, like, just singing to everybody. And he was like, dude, I saw you singing at the show. And he, like, asked me at the skate park. Like, it was, really? like, something out of, like, a movie. That's you hilarious. You my band, man. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and then, so we, we had this band called Another Heather. Okay. It was, like, a fun punk band. It was kind of ska, like, right. around that same time when we were just, like, like, 1990. Six ninety seven, where it was sort of just like oh, yeah. suicide machines, right. like Less Than Jake, like kind of all this Rubik stuff. Fish, all yeah, Rubik stuff. Fish, yeah, yeah, yeah. Blink One Eighty Two, but it was just like oh, but everything's rad. Like yeah. we we're like we we're there wasn't like oh, you listen to ska, so you have to wear like a suit. Like, yeah, it wasn't yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. It was just like oh, this is all just punk. Yeah, and we all just like hang out and listen to it. Yeah, because it was like the nineties was a weird time for punk there because like 
I remember, like, to me, everything was fucking punk. Like, I mean, now everything kind of no, still but is that, punk. that, like, definition. Yeah. Because there was weird... I remember telling this like, story Guar the other day. Like, was punk to me. Guar was punk. I mean, they identify as being punk. Right. But also, I remember going to see Rancid with Rocket from the Crypt supporting. Right. And I was like, well, that's punk. Yeah. Because, well, like, nothing gets more punk than Rancid. So, like, obviously these two bands are punk on the same... Because I'm 16, and I'm like... Well, this has to be punk. Well, Whereas, that's like when I saw Guar, it was with Guar and Mephiscopheles. Yeah. So like, right? and Guar has horns, <laughs> right? And it's like punk, and they're making fun of metal, <laughs> and you're like, yeah, this is this is punk, right? Okay. <laughs> but I'm with I'm with that. Like, there was so much that I like I didn't understand at that time what hardcore was. Right. So like, you're listening to bands, like hearing like trying to think of like early hardcore bands like you would hear like Warzone and Black Flag and sure. like stuff like that like Circle Jerks and no one was like this is a hardcore band they yeah because it was still it was still just punk Black, Fla- just, like, Black Flag I will always just consider to be punk yeah. you know what I mean and that was how we all just like oh okay yeah. this is just punk all until like, like you the only thing that, that started to step outside for me is um, there was a drummer uh, that that was came up around the same time as I did and he started getting into, like, full-on noise. Oh, okay. And I was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, like, that was where <laughs> you saw... So, for us, the big one was when, like, bands like... So, our ska band, our, like, punk ska band, mm. would play with, like, uh, like hardcore bands. So, okay. that was where there was, like, this big... So, they were, like, you know, mixing bills. Mm-hmm. And, obviously, our punk band did really well. So, it was like, oh, you guys should come and play. And one of the shows was Countdown to Oblivion. Okay. So it was like, oh, like, another Heather and Countdown to Oblivion are going to play, and it'll be sick. And there was this band, like, wearing, they had two singers, they had balaclavas on, like, they were playing Slayer riffs, like, in between, like, parts. Like, it was chaos. Right. And the singer, like, Chris Callahan was, like, terrorizing, like, everyone, and it was awesome. Yeah. And, like, we, like, broke up our punk band, like, right after that. Really? Because we were just like, oh, well, everything that we're doing is, like, <laughs> like total bullshit. Really? Yeah, in comparison to this. And it was as we were, like, starting to listen to all that stuff. So right. it was, like, seeing that band, but also, like, listening to Youth of Today and also, like, listening to H2O. And, and just, listen- like, fuck it, we're done. Because I was just like, oh, yeah, like, this is just, like, now. This was more when I was, like, 18... You know, like, 19, and I'm pretty sure it was when I was 18. Because then we, we broke that band up, and we're like, we're starting a hardcore band. So you broke the band up and started, a, this like, with the same group same of guys? Same group of guys. We got a second singer. So right. my friend, who I'm still, like, really good friends with, came in and became the singer. The the guitar player became the drummer. Okay. We got a different, you know, like, that kind of, like... just shuffled everything, like, yeah. fuck it, just And we were just, everything. like, we just want to sound like Snapcase. We just want to <laughs> sound like, you yeah. know, like... Like, uh, Victory Records okay. in, like, 1999. Like, yeah. Grade. Like, that. all that stuff was happening. Like, yeah. 98, 99. Like, kind of, like... But we were also... At that same time, there was, like, Deftones. And, like, yeah. all of... Like, Quicksand. And, like, all of that is happening. So you're just, like... Music is crazy. Everywhere. We need to, like... We can't play punk rock ska anymore. Right. Like... Even AFI doesn't sound like AFI anymore. Like yeah. everything was shifting. Everything did, yeah, and everything did shift right around then too. I mean, I'm I've got like two years on you or three years on you or whatever. So I was just a little bit ahead of that curve too. Oh, okay. right? So like I was getting into the I was getting into the, the time of my life when you know I, my wife and stuff and, and starting to move that way. So like music became less and less of a thing. Oh, uh, okay. So you just started immersing. Yourself I was more just more, like, right? oh my god, like everything is crazy because yeah. that was also when we realized like there was like. Shows, like, that were happening in Waterloo that were, like, okay. We would go to shows in London or Guelph, like I said, that were pretty good. But then we started going to, like, Oakville and Burlington to go see, like, real hardcore shows. Right. And it was, like, on the floor, like, metalcore, crazy. Serious hardcore in in Toronto, eh? Yeah. And then we started going to, like, to Toronto to go to, like, Who's Emma and the Cathedral. Sorry, it's all fucking Toronto to me. But, but, like, the suburbs had, like, a crazy scene at that time. So, like, in Oakville, in the (laughs) suburbs, they would, like have shows at the Y or they would have shows at like this hockey rink and there was like a hall and it would basically just be like a floor show and like local bands would play and there'd be like 200 kids at the show. No shit. It was sick. So it was like we would drive 
to these shows to just be like a part of this whole scene. Just to be in, just to go see the show. Yeah. Yeah. And that was like, I was just like, oh, I'm in. Were you traveling with the band at the time or was that all, were you guys kind of staying close to home? No, this was like just like friends. Because okay. I felt like that was that era too of like being 19. It was like, who's like really into being in a band and wanting to go on tour. It's a tough thing to, to figure out when you're that young, right? Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. you're just like, oh, we all want to be in this band, but... Do you really? Like, people don't want to go on tour. They just like playing shows. Or right. they like having band practice. Right. Which there's nothing wrong with that. Nope. But when you're a kid, you're like, you're either with it. Well, it's know? not just when you're a kid. It's when you're a kid that has a desire to take it further mm-hmm. than just mom's basement. Like, I, you know, growing up with all those kids, I remember, like, everybody talked to talk. Like, everybody's like, oh, yeah, we're going to be huge. And then it's like, like, my first thing was like, but how? You're fucking, we're like... You're not doing anything to move forward. Yeah. When did when did you start noticing there was a difference there? Of like touring. Well, of of between because you just said like you're you're at that time where you're picking out the people that really want to be in a band and don't really want to be in a band. How long did it take you to start figuring out the difference? Uh, I think like by the that band ended up breaking up in like 1999. Okay. So then we were like, okay, we all like me and the other singer wanted to be in like more serious bands and the drummer. I remember John. He wanted to be, like, in more serious kind of stuff. Right. And so that was where it was just, like, well, you guys don't want to tour. Like, we played a show in Toronto. Uh, or we played a couple shows in Toronto, and we were like, this is sick. And then they were like, no. No, this like sucks. Yeah, yeah, this sucks. we got to, like, blow my mom's car and blah, 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 blah. So then we were all like, okay, we're just going to start, yeah. you know, different bands. It's, it's a weird, especially that age, too. It's a weird moment when you start going, like, ah, oh, fuck. It, it, it's not coming together the way we thought it. Or you're just, like, genuinely excited, and yeah. you're like, oh, okay, like, if you guys don't want to be a part of this scene... Oh, was it that? You're yeah, just we're like, like, fuck it, we're going... Because we're like, <laughs> London is sick, like, Guelph is sick, like, I know that there's a really good hardcore scene in Ottawa, like, mm-hmm. there's all these bands coming out of Ottawa, there's bands, like, when we go down to, like, Windsor, there's, like, cool stuff happening, and then this was, like, as I was, like, 19, and then 20, that was when those shows in Oakville were, like, getting really big, and they were having, like, big fests... And it was, like, when, like, hardcore was, like, starting to, like, become a thing. We were going to the cathedral in Toronto all the time right. to go see, like, Converge and Hatebreed and all this stuff. Um, and around that same time, like, yeah, it was when I was, like, okay, I'm going to, like... Do this for real. Yeah, I want to do this for real. I was sort of at this tipping point because I was, like, I really was, like, kind of, like, getting in with snowboarding. Not being pro, but more, like, on the industry side. Okay. Like, I was, like, oh, I'm, like, actually good at selling snowboards. I, like, understand this whole world. And I could see the, like, quick jump to, like, working for, like, a brand. Okay. So I was just, like, hanging out, like, helping out on, like, demo days with, like, Solomon or Ride or, like, different kind of snowboard companies. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I was, like, oh, this is really sick. Like, I really liked this aspect. So... I wasn't doing it a ton. Like well, it's non- funny because that kind of business has like it's it's modular, right? It's not specific to a store. It's you got to kind yeah, of yeah, and it is around. it is that kind of like mobile, and it's exciting. Like you're mm-hmm. going to different spots, you're meeting different people, you're like so and it's a bit of a show, right? And you're it's, traveling, yeah, it's, you're a traveling salesman. Well, and it's just like fun. It's yeah. like new and different, and like that side of things, like being cool. Okay. Um. So yeah, so that's where I was just like, eh, I don't know which like I'm gonna do. Um, but then, yeah, I remember I moved to Ottawa was like another big, cause th- at that time I was like, I don't want to drink anymore. I don't want to party anymore. Okay. I was, yeah. So that was like a big one because I had like met all these guys from Ottawa. Right. There was a ton of bands happening in that city. Uh, so that was the time of like buried inside roads to Shiloh. Um, it's better uh, snowboarding up there too. It's funny because I think at that point I was already just, like, so you, into... You had focused on music? Yeah, I was just yeah. like, this is so sick. And I think, like, becoming kind of, like, straight edge and seeing how, like, positive that whole side of things was. Right. Because also in snowboarding, it's so much partying. Yeah. So it's de- that's, like, a huge part of that culture. Okay. Is, like, is, like, partying and drinking and all of that is, like, really revered. And so I think that was part of me also, like, stepping away from it, too. It was just, like... I think people think about music a lot like that, too. Like, Yo, yeah. Like, yeah. But that was where I saw this other city as well. So oh. I was, like, okay, I'm going to, like, stop drinking. I want to, like, kind of, like, move away from all this. And then there was this city that was really chill, uh, and everyone was straight edge. 
Oh, sweet. So I was like, oh, I'm going to go and hang out with these guys. I have family from up there. Like, I had a job. So I was like, I'm going to move to Ottawa and just, like, hang out with all these rad dudes. And because to me, like, I was like, oh, Buried Inside is, like, such a sick band. They're doing so much cool stuff. And I just, like, showed up and went to a show and, like, met all of them. Oh, sweet. And was like, oh, okay, well, I feel super at home here. And my brother was already living there. He was going to law school. So I, like, stayed with my brother, found an apartment, and was just like, I'm straight edge. This is sick. Talk to me about Ottawa as a town. I, I just, I went there for the first time just on this last trip oh, a couple okay. of weeks ago. And it, I didn't get to explore too, too much, but it's a, it, it looks like such an interesting town. Like, it's, it's... Yeah, it's, it's cool. It's, like, yeah. definitely sleepy. Is it? Yeah, it's definitely, like, uh, like, there's lots of cool stuff that's happening. There was tons of shows, like... Sean Scallon, who was, like, putting on shows, like, all, like I said, like, all those bands were, like, really active. Okay. But as far as, like, the city goes, like, at a certain, like, at 9 o'clock, it's, like... Shut down. Shut down. Everybody's got to go to bed to be up for the government in the morning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's, like, there's cool parts of it, but then there's also, like, uh, this town is, like, kind of conservative. <laughs> you know? I love Ottawa. Right. Don't get me wrong. But, it's, uh, it's got a hell of a music scene, though. It's got a and real that's tight music cool. com- community. Right? Yeah, and they have always had, like, really good shows. And that was, like, I met so many. That was where I ended up meeting, like, the bass player who would, you know, uh, start Cancer Bats with me. Right. Um, who, like, still to this day does all the graphic design for the band. Like, he's, like, one of my best friends. Right. Um, so that whole, like, kind of community was, like, really important, I feel like. For, like, one, understanding, like, how to run a band in early kind of like punk like oh, okay like you guys book your own tours you do all of this stuff yourself like everything is super DIY I was like okay I can like do this mm-hmm. uh, I just need to like join a band to do it it's, it's funny because that's so true because like in the, in, in the well in the 90s and I'm sure through the 2000s the punk rock and hardcore scene specifically because labels weren't picking them up no it was before that big <clears throat> like boom that happened in like 2002-2003 right so like yeah this was especially like going to Ottawa like you would have like Hatebreed would play at a bar or like some hardcore shows would happen at bars but for the most part they were at like smaller like Ottawa had like an art gallery that had a stage in it that like Sean Scallon was like you know basically like running to like keep the scene and like having things like that's great because it gave you another sort of like introduction you took the stuff you already knew about business and gave you a little training course on how to run oh totally right? but we were used to running like DIY shows in Waterloo because that was like such a big thing mm-hmm. and you would just like for us like we were always just like oh we'll just do the shows ourselves and we are just like work backwards to like how you have like a sold out show so how did Cancer Bat start? Uh, so Cancer Bat started so I went from Ottawa moved around a bunch and then I Met a girl and then moved to Montreal. Always the fucking story. <laughs> uh, and I was like, also because I was kind of like, and eh, there was band stuff happening, but again, it wasn't like really. I was like playing drums in some bands. I was sing, I sang in a band. So I met like a bunch of people. That's how I met Scott uh, Middleton. And then I moved because I was just kind of like, eh, you know what? Like I'm over this. Like, and here's like just like a fun opportunity. So maybe I'll just like move to Montreal. And I was like, Montreal's a cool city. I can join a band from there. Right. Like, I had met the guys who were in um, some bands, but a lot of, like, French guys. I didn't really know the French-English kind of, like, split right. in Montreal as well. I could speak a bit of French, but anyways, I was like, I'm going to move to Montreal. And because I was young, I was just like, sure. I'm out of here. See you, right. <laughs> so I moved to Montreal, and I was there for four years, just kind of, like, hanging out. Okay. Like, I worked a job. I was, like, going to lots of shows. It's and got a really good, interesting scene in Montreal. Montreal right? had a sick scene, yeah. and it was, like, even though I wasn't playing at the time, like, it was great to be, like, seeing, especially, like, that was, like, when Arcade Fire, uh, like, Wolf Parade, like, the Unicorns, like, there was so much cool indie rock happening that mm-hmm. was, like, super inspiring. I got to see tons of hip-hop. I got to see tons of, like, just, like, eclectic like tons of hardcore shows too like Sal X was going um so I just was more like just like taking in all of this music I had a good job so I was just like buying tons of music oh sweet also so just like every CD I could ever get my hands on I was just like consuming well and you had the job too so you had time to the listen. job was like yeah and yeah. it was cool and Montreal is all about that like it's not about like working hard and like doing it's like 
go and chill. Yeah, get records. Go listen yeah. to them. Like, drink coffee and right. hang out. So that scene, I, like, kind of was like, oh, yeah, I get this. Nice. But then I was going back to Toronto, and I was, like, seeing all my friends that were, like, starting to do lots of cool stuff. Okay. So that was when, like, Alexis on Fire was, like, really starting to, like, pop. Right. And they were, like, coming through. They'd gotten signed to Distort. And I was like, I had met those guys before when I was in another band. So I was just like, oh, dude, this is so sick. Right. But like Comeback Kid was also starting to like really like get some attention. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. So it became a thing that could happen for real. Yeah, I was like seeing how much like my friends bands and I like wanted to be a part of that, but I didn't have anybody who was doing that in Montreal. Right. So then Scott and I basically started Cancer Bats while I still lived in Montreal. Okay. So he worked for Via Rail. Oh, so okay. it was like really easy for him to come. So the first few jams were actually like in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And it was me playing drums and him playing guitar. And I was like, dude, let's do this. So we like wrote some riffs and it was like sounding really cool. And then I convinced my friend Andrew, the guy from Ottawa, to play bass in it. Mm -hmm. And then we found a drummer because we were also just like, I live in Montreal, this isn't going to be like a serious band, but it'll be fun. Right. We can just do it. And Scott was in At the Mercy of Inspiration at okay. the time. So that was like, oh, this band, they were like going to get signed. They were starting to tour in the States. They were starting to play all over the place. So we were like, oh, So sick. we already had a taste. Yeah. And he was like doing some cool stuff. So I was already like... I would come down in the summer and when I was around, I would like go on tour with them. I would like sell merch for them. Oh, okay. Like I was like really good friends with all those oh, dudes. So I was like, Oh, I'll just come and hustle your merch. Cause like that's something I can do. Mm -hmm. So I would do that a lot. Uh, and then cancer rats was going at the same time. This was summer of 2004 and at moi, sorry, at the mercy of inspiration, short form at moi is what we would call it. <laughs> Uh, they were supposed to do a Western Canadian tour. Okay. So I got a month off of work, and I was like, I'm going to go on this tour for a month. It's going to be sick. I'm going to sell merch. We can kind of, like, hustle Cancer Bats as well. But it was still early days. Like, we had, sure. like, a very rough cassette demo. Or maybe nice. we even had, like, this CD demo at that point. But anyways, we were, like, very, like, early days. No, we hadn't even recorded our CD demo. So okay. we had, like, sorry, cassette demos. And, uh... So I was, like, going to go on this tour, and then literally we played Sudbury, and the, like, guy who was setting up the tour was like, dudes, don't come on the tour. Like, all of the shows have fallen through. Like, obviously just, like, kind of, like, last minute being like, I blew it. Ooh. Like, this is super sketchy. Please don't, like, commit to doing this. Uh, at least he was good enough to tell you before you hit the road. Yeah. Uh, so that's, there were, that's better than a lot of promoters. There was, like, a bunch of kind of, like, obviously stuff that, like... Like, the band was just like, what are we doing, yeah. and all this stuff. And I was like, okay, well, I've already got the month off of work. So I went to Scott, and I was like, why don't we just work on can Like, I'll stay in Toronto, I'll stay with Andrew, and we can just, like, work on Cancer Bats, like, every single day. And he was, like, sick. Because I think he kind of caught the vibe that, like, his band was sort of, like, on its way out. Right. Like, that was, like, a last kind of, like, yeah. So he was, like, super down. Um, so I was like, okay, so we jammed, like... For a month, we just jammed every oh, single day. That's 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 pretty fucking. And that's that was fundamental. Like, kind of like seeing that opportunity <clears throat> and talking to the singer of Scott's band was just like, yeah, man, like go do it. Oh, that's and that great. was like the dude who I was like, I'm gonna do this, and he was like, yeah, you should go for it because I don't know what's happening with this band. Nice. So I was like, okay, that's cool. really cool, man. That's that's really big of that dude. Yeah. Oh, and it was sick because he wanted to go to Japan. Like he was like he had his mind on other things right. too. So I was like, okay, we're cool, and like the other guys, they don't care. Right. So I was like, okay. So then me, Scott, and Andrew, like started really hitting it, uh, and that's when we dude, recorded we're going every day for a month. That's like getting yeah. three years of fucking practices in. Oh, yeah. You know, well, and if you're getting like, together once a fucking week, even, you know what I mean? Like, because that's your standard bands and shit, right? But that was by the time, so I was 24. Right. So by, like, starting a band that's not doing anything, and for us... There's no point. Well, no, that was like, we either need to, like, like kind of hit it. Yeah. Like, and do this. And that was where I was, like, looking at, like... Like, I was friends with the guys in Wolf Parade. Like, I was really close to Arcade Fire. Like, right. I saw, like... Dudes going from, like, playing, like, a house show to, like, doing a full U.S. tour and coming back and, like, being minted. And you saw what it was. And I was like, like yeah. oh, well, like, obviously we're going to do a hardcore band and that's way different. But, like, Alexis on Fire was, like, 
dudes, like, do this. That's amazing. Like, come on tour with us. And so by the time we had, like, kind of... Um, so this was kind of like now... We finished the summer. It was in the fall. And we were, like, getting ready to do a tour. Because, like, Scott had all of these connects from being in At The Mercy. Mm-hmm. So it was, like, tons of people were like, oh, we want to see your new band. Oh, that's We want to do this. And then the East Coast was like, yo, you should come on tour. Like, we could, like, book. This was right away? Like This was that, right away. Oh, that's great. So then we were like, we... This was, like, around January of 2005. Okay. So we did our, like, little East Coast tour. It was awesome. Uh, we linked up with, like, friends bands and, like, played really good shows. Um, we had, like, maybe 11 minutes of music at that really? point. Like, we had nothing. Because <laughs> we were just, like, so psyched. We just, like, went on tour the right away. The next time some fucking band tells me they're not ready to go out. <laughs> I would argue that I think most bands shouldn't. Right. But for us, we were just like, we have to do this. And I was in such a rush because yeah. I felt like we had to, like, play catch up for all of these other bands that were going. Right. So, like, because in Toronto, it was, like, cursed and fucked up. And, like, uh, Comeback Kid was coming through and, like, selling, like, you know, like, tons of tickets to their shows. And, like, obviously Alexis was going. And we were just, like, seeing all this stuff. We were like, man, we need to catch up. Like, Silverstein was, like starting to like really catch on so you felt you felt like you were behind the, the totally i felt like going to montreal had like set me back really okay in hindsight i i think it was like really important because sure. like but at the time yeah at the time i was just like we gotta like we gotta hurry up we gotta catch up and it was because the alexis guys were like dude like we'll get you signed to our label like we'll like help you guys out we'll show you how to tour right they were like just do it so then that was how we met, like, Greg at Distort, and that was kind of, like, how all that stuff happened. And so it's just been, you've been going pretty steady since then? Yeah, we had to, like, play catch-up, because obviously <clears throat> we only had six songs mm-hmm. at that point, so we had to write, like, a full record, and we had to do all this stuff. How long did it take you to get there? Um, probably the rest of 2005. Yeah, the full year? Yeah, and then we started recording in the in the winter were you touring the whole time yeah but just like the five six day like Ontario kind okay. of stuff but we had gone to the states with Alexis we had done like two weeks in the states we would started like doing that kind of stuff so all through 2005 we were like that was when we met every time I die that was when we like started doing all these kind of things mm-hmm. and I, by that point I had moved to Toronto Okay. So I was like full time Toronto. What was the because you you played all kinds of venues, right? Like you played some pretty major venues, right? Uh, some, some, at that point, we hadn't, but now. But yeah. now you have. What was what was like the first like, the first big stage you played? Um, the first one that was like this is more than just your a regular bar gig. I'm trying to think. Because, like, even just playing the embassy in London, yeah. like, that was, like, a bigger... Right. Because you would see, like, that was where the big punk bands played. Yeah. Like, that was where I saw, you know, like, str- uh, like Strung Out, and, like, that was where you went and saw... I'm trying to think of who else I saw, like, big shows there. But, yeah, it was, like... Oh. And that's, so even that And that's, was like, even... an 800 cap, yeah. like, technically. Right. Oversold. But it was, like, we saw big shows there. So even early on, you kind of got a taste of, like, playing... Of, band. like, playing that. Yeah. Because, like, we went and saw Bane and I remember like we jumped on uh, do you remember that band Keep It Up it was like a hardcore band from yeah. Welland anyways we jumped on their gear and we played one song oh, yeah? at like the Bane show oh, fun. and that was like packed and people were moshing we played like Shillelagh because it was like the fourth song we had we played that song uh, and I remember just being like oh this is sick we just like crushed the song kids moshed it's funny because I'm, I'm trying to think the first time I the first time I heard of you guys was uh, probably 2008, 2009, something like that. Oh, okay. And it was because there was a guy that was doing some work for me, Mike Pajax. He's a, he's a great guy locally. Shout out to you, Mike. Uh, but he was wearing a Cancer Bats, Cancer Bats t-shirt. And I'm oh, like, okay. who the fuck is this? And because like the thing you got to understand about Mike, Mike is like, Mike is fucking punk rock, right? And so if I see Mike wearing a shirt that I don't know who it is, I'm like, uh, right? And so that was my first introduction to you guys, and it was right around 2009. So you, what were you guys doing at that point? That was, 2009 was when it was, like, full on. So yeah. by the time, like, 2006, like, by the time, like, Birthing the Giant came out, we were just, like, 
on on tour constantly. Yeah. So we we literally like put that record out the same time as Alexis put out Crisis. And how did the record do? It did awesome. Yeah. You um, put it out on your own, right? No, no, no. It came out through oh, Distort. Okay. Yeah. So that was like Distort put out basically like us, the gorgeous. Uh, and Alexis on fire. Oh, sweet! So it kind of so like it was like a crisis trip. came out, and we went on tour with like Alexis. Every time I die, us, and then like Attack and Black was like around that same time. Yeah. So we were just like, was we that toured. a North American tour or just? Yeah, came out? and we did all of like UK Europe with really? them. Really? Yeah. Wow. Tell me about that tour because you must have had. I, I knew you. You've got some decent stories. Any any you any ones you can tell? Uh, <laughs> that tour was like that Canadian tour was crazy because like obviously the whole thing was like massive. Right. Uh, and like that was us stepping into like a completely because we had played big shows with Alexis before, mm-hmm. especially like when we went down to the states. Like it was like, oh man, we're playing like to, you know, like a thousand kids, or right. we're like we had kind of like stepped in that world a little bit, like playing with Every Time I Die. It's like we're playing to five hundred kids. Like this right. is crazy. We're selling a lot of merch. Like oh okay. Um, but then when we stepped into like playing to two thousand people. And it was like, oh, we're playing to like 2,000 people like every single night. So we're like selling merch to 2,000 people every single night. And it was like, this is nuts. So that was like, that whole year was like the craziest crash course in like touring and like just like what that, that world is. What was the toughest lesson? Um, I don't even know if there was any tough ones, but that was a big one where like every time I die and Alexis... Like, kind of, like, we're just, like, this is how you do. Oh, and we had sort of learned from Every Time I Die a lot, because we toured with them, like, uh, in 2005. And that was, like, the band that we looked up to. Okay. So, for us, we were just, like, oh, these guys stretch before they play. Holy shit, man. You lucked out every step of the way. You, know you what had I mean? amazing like, mentors. Yeah. yeah. Like, just, like, seeing these kind of things and being, like, oh, Andy, you're straight edge. Like, cool. And, like, Keith, you're, like, really rad, and you write cool lyrics. And, like, yeah. it was just, like... That was when Rap Boy was in the band, so, like, you know, us being straight edge as well, like, it was like, oh, cool. Right. Like, we had these, like, cool dudes. And then by the time the, like, um, Alexis tour happened, like, that was where I met their tour manager, and he was just like, I'm going to teach you how to tour. Like, I'm going to teach you how to, like, hustle merch. I'm going to teach you, like, how to count money. I'm going to teach you, like, everything. Like, here's how you should settle a show. Here's how you should do. So this is, like, for me, I'm, like, 26 I'm, like, kind of, like, you know, new to some of this. He's, like, this is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. Like, (coughs) it was the best. That's amazing, man. And it was watching those guys, like, also crush a tour, like, in a van and trailer. And, like... Because that's the... That's the album that really kicked them off, right? Like, it... it, Yeah, that was when, like... For for it that was when like um, Gutter Phenomenon was coming out. So Hot Damn was already like really big, and then that was when like next round of like like you know next level kind of stuff was happening. Mm-hmm. So it was like also seeing these guys like doing really well, and like same with like Alexis, like they like how they ran their business was just like so like eye opening. Yeah. But then at, at every different level, so like Canada was obviously like really big, and then we went to the states where like the shows were, you know there was like 300 people at a okay. show or like sometimes there'd be like under a hundred people like in a weird town in Kentucky. And so, so it's weird, right? That's when we were like <laughs> learning like what like a real like 40 day U S grinder tour is. Right. And that's where you're like, Oh, okay. So you do Canada and you like, it's sick and you like make all this money and you like kind of pay off all your bills and you do all this stuff. But then you, then you go to work. Drive across like <laughs> sixty hours across America, and like you play to no one. Right. And like that's the reality for everyone. And what Monine was... was on that tour too, and okay. we were like Alexis, Monine, and us like touring America, and we were just like, but you guys are like the sickest bands. Like you guys are like killing it, but even like here, it like doesn't translate. Doesn't matter. Well, it's it's funny because like I've got it, after Gord Downey died. There was a guy locally that put up some photos, and it was photos of, at one point, Lauren Michaels had taken them over to New York to try to push him in the States. Oh, okay. And I think they were on Saturday Night Live or something, but while they were in New York, they had played at a couple of, like, underground clubs, and there was a guy locally who had just happened to wander into one of these clubs, and there's the tragically fucking hip 
playing the six people. Oh, totally. Right. We've played that show in Manhattan. Right. Where you're like playing the basement and there's like 10 people. Right. And you're like, man, we're at a point in our career where like we play to like a thousand people like in other cities. It's humbling, right? Yeah. Oh, totally. And that was like the big thing that was really cool to see was like, oh yeah, but you're still grinding. Like yeah. you're still just the punk band when you show up and Dow was driving, you know? And it was like, yeah, they got off the bus and they got in the van and trailer and then it was like sound guy, merch guy touring. It's funny because like you think of a guy like Henry Rollins, right? So I don't know, is there a bigger fucking name when it comes to punk and shit, right? Like it managed to turn it into like movies and all this other stuff. But like you read Get in the Van and like it's the same fucking story as you. Oh, hear yeah. From, right. Yeah, totally. It, it's there's almost a mythology to it. Like there's almost. That's almost, when you really get to it, that's almost what you want, more than even the show sometimes, I think. Oh, and there's, like, that side of, like, you're hearing all these stories of other bands. Mm -hmm. Like, back in the day, we were, like, obsessed with, we had heard, like, that Misery Signals had played 300 shows in a year. Okay. So we were just, like, like obsessed with that idea. Like, we have to play. There was, like, two things. We had to play 300 shows in a year. And it was, like, the time that Modern Life is War was, like, out, and they had that song, Dead Ramones. Okay. And, they had, and the line in it was 28 shows, 28 days. And so we're, like, you have to, we have to play 28 <laughs> shows in a row, and we have to, like, go on play 300 shows in a year. And we hit 300 shows in a year in 12 months, like, way before we ever played 28 shows in a row. Really? Yeah, it was just, like, impossible to, like, eke out <laughs> Line this exact... Monday shows are tough to book, man. Yeah, and you just have <laughs> days off. Like, you right. finish a 26-day tour. Especially in fucking Canada. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. or, like, across the States. We just, like, could never do it. It wasn't right. until, like, 2009 that we were able to do you it. Did, you got it? But we played, like, 2006, 2007, and 2008. We played, like, 300 shows within those, like kind of like cycles and we still managed to like write and record uh hail destroyer like in that time and it was just like it's like crazy but talking about like mythos it's like oh like that was like even a thing we were like talking about and living and like counting like shows to like see if we could do it. it it's great because it it gives you a goal. It gives you something to go after rather than just like, oh, we're going to go hit the next fucking show. Well, and it's when you, you kind of like learn how something works. Yeah. Because you're just like, oh, to us, like Misery Signals is killing it. So we're just like, well, obviously, like you get to that point by like playing tons of shows. And same with like every time I die, we're just like, this band is on tour always. So we're just like, we want to just be like road hardened, like beasts mm. like this. And the only way to get there is to just like tour. And so everyone is kind of, like, egging each other on and, like, talking about it. Like, same, Comeback Kid tours like crazy. Like, Alexis tours like crazy. Like, you know, we ended up meeting the Rise Against guys because that was that whole same kind of crew. And it was just like, oh, you guys tour super hard. And they, like, again, took us under their wing, like, 2007, just being like, yo, this is, like, touring. This is how you have a girlfriend while you're on tour. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's just hilarious, like, really man. Cool. Like, life fucking, like, yeah, life yeah, yeah, advice yeah. and shit. Because everyone, like, and we're like this, too, you see, like, your former self. Right. And you're, like, kind of, like, instead of, like, going back when you're 16, you're just like, yo, dude, I'm going to go, like, to the internet cafe to make a phone call. Like, this is how you can make an international phone call because your cell phone doesn't work here. Right. And I was like, sick. Let's go do this. (laughs) Right. And you, like, call home and you're like, oh, I get it. Or, like, Tim from Rise Against would, like, take me and we would, like, write postcards and he was like, dude, I write postcards all the time. And I was like, that's a sick idea. So I would, like, go with him to, like, the post office. Oh, and hilarious. I was like, oh, this is rad. Like, okay, I understand, like, being a good dude on tour and, like, right. having, like, these, like, cool examples. Like, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, tour yeah. sick. That's hilarious. Yeah. It's, it's because it's funny because you're now talking about the stuff that you never think about. That is so vital. Oh, totally. Right? Because it's, it's the, how do you live your fucking life? It's not just how do you go be a musician, but how do you not end up blowing it all apart? Right? Yeah. And just, like, you'd hear all those, like, everyone would just be, like, tour in a van as long as you can. Like, don't go into a bus. Right. Tour in a van until it's going to, like, literally break your band up. Because that's the only way that you make money. So you would have, like, people, like, telling you these things. Mm-hmm. And they'd be like, see those guys on the bus? They don't have any money because they're on a bus. They'd be like, tour in a van as long as you possibly can. You're like, okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, like you're right. like 26 being like, I don't live anywhere. Right. So yes, I'll tour in this van. Cause like when we got our van in 2007, we had to get a new van. We like literally none of us like lived anywhere. And me and Mikey were like, we might as well just like book tour for the next like, you know, nine months. Cause like then we're not sleeping on people's couches and like bumming people out. Like we'll just like do that. And that was like the biggest like that was when we did those Rise Against tours. Right. We just like linked up tour to tour. Just did nine months. Nine months solid. And then we came home and started writing uh, Hail. So that was like, okay, we got home. Wait, how do you come home? You don't have one. We we like <laughs> all found places. Okay. I like stayed in my friend's loft. I like literally had a tent in my friend's loft. <laughs> but then it was also kind of like when we first started the band, I was like, okay, we only have X amount of time to do this. And we were still touring while we were doing it. Cause our, our label like Distort was like, this record was great. We need record two. Like we gotta like move things forward. Right. Like, okay. But he's like, I need it by like this date. So we were like, okay. So we like figured out a plan and we already knew that we were gonna be doing some other touring in the fall. Like we had like awesome tours booked. Mm -hmm. So we were just like, okay, we only have like this amount of time. So we were jamming for literally like 12 noon until midnight. Like that was when the jam space was like open. Right. But it was also such a cool <clears throat> space to like be in. Mm -hmm. um, Cause it was like Billy Talent was jamming upstairs we were already we had toured with them we were friends with those guys right they were working on i guess billy talent three okay. at that point um three days grace was there uh it was when like so a bunch of fucking nobodies edwin was <laughs> working on the crash karma like wow. kind of stuff so it was like yeah. during the day and then across the hall was that band rammer if you remember that metal band from toronto no anyways just like yeah. they were like a like death metal band oh it's very sick and so it was just, like, all of us, like, daytime was just, like, blasting. Yeah. Like, so heavy and so loud. And, like, everyone was going for it. Mm -hmm. And it was, like, I'm not into Three Days Grace, but it was, like, we all had this connection. Like, all of us had worked with Gavin Brown. Right. All of us were kind of in the same vibe. So it was, like, super nice dudes. So you, you were just, like, oh, everyone's, like, creating and being excited and, so like, cool it's stuff. It's really going. interesting to be it, – it, it's it, – it's – it's unusual to be able to be sort of immersed in an environment like that. Yeah. And that was like what the rehearsal factory was like on the East end. Yeah. And so we were literally like, we would just like ride our bicycles like across town, uh, like jam all day. Uh, and then like, just like ride home or like go to a show, like come back, jam more. Yeah. I remember Scott and I went and saw Slayer, uh, cause bleeding through was like opening. We were right. like, we had toured with them. So we went and hung out with, like, Bleeding Through. We watched Slayer. And then we left halfway through Slayer's set so we could, like, go. And we wrote Pray for Darkness. Oh, nice. Like, in the last, like, hour. Like, we got there at 11 and we jammed until, like, midnight. And that was where we wrote this, like, quick D-beat song. And it was, then like, sick, check. Down. Like, we just need 40 minutes of music right. to, like, contractually That's, have this done. That's fucking awesome. So, because... Am, am I correct? Like, you guys have been, I don't know if won or nominated, but you guys have been nominated for... Never January. won, but we, yeah, we got nominated a couple of times, right? Four times now. What was the first one? Uh, first one was for... I guess it was for Hail Destroyer in 2009. Talk to me about that experience, because especially with... We had, like, Best New Artist was and basically it, but the... But coming up as a fucking punk rock band, Award winning never comes into the fucking no. picture. No, and that was the thing. Like it w we got nominated the first year that like fucked up. Also got nominated. Uh, Monine got nominated. So it was like kind of like when a lot of that stuff was like changing. Okay. So we were like, we're not gonna win, <laughs> um, but we were like, this is really cool that we're even getting recognized. Right. Um, to like do this. Does it? Does and, like, do I ended up, me and Dal gave away, like, a bunch of awards. Like, we presented. Oh, yeah? Not on TV, but, like, we were still, like, selected. So, that was kind of cool, too, because, mm -hmm. like, that was, like, them being, like, well, you guys are obviously, like, a thing. Because, like, you couldn't deny that Alexis was, like, like huge. Right. And Billy Talent was already, they had been on the Junos and stuff. Right. But it was, like, that was a really interesting time. But we felt, like, because so much had, like, stepped up for Hail Destroyer... Like, that was, like, the real record where we went from, like, playing, you know, like, 
you know, good shows to like playing like, oh, these shows are big and like these shows are crazy. When, when was like big for us being like, there's like three and 400 kids at a show. When, when was the first time you were that? Like other than like just regular whatever shows, but when was the first time you were the headliner? We headlined right off the bat. Oh yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really? Because we could never find, we could never find like tours. So we would do supports, like we would support whatever bands we could. But then you would but just then tour it was your just own. like oh, you're just fuck. headline on our own. So you you built it up just like every other street band, yeah. just kind of get in there and book a show at Fog or where. Well, I mean, like today's Don Polsky, but like, yeah, but yeah. like we played the skate park, you know, here. Like right. we and it was because we met like Jim Maloche, we knew from Searching for Chin, mm-hmm. who like my old bands had played with and Scott's old bands. Right. Uh, Jim actually put out our first seven inch. Oh, cool. Um, so we would come down and like play, but uh, yeah, it was definitely just like for us, like we're always headlining. And you're still because being it now. a Canadian band, we couldn't even find like support. Really? Because we'd be like, oh, we're gonna headline in like February uh, in Western Canada, and we would like try and get submissions, and we'd be like, these shows are gonna be sick, and then like no one would want to do the tour. So how the fuck do you even promote those shows? Uh, well, that was where we were just like, let's just do local bands. So okay. we were always like, let's just, like, we'll play. And that's what we met Holly Springs Disaster. Like, that's mm-hmm. what we met, like, all sorts of rad kids from out west. Because we were like, we just want to go on tour. So we, like, booked our first Western Canadian tour in 2006, summer 2006. We booked that, like, ourselves. Oh, yeah. Before we had, like, an agent or anything. Because we were just like, we just have to do this. And we were on Distort, and he was like, you have to do this. So you've got this new tour now. Yeah. Is, is this part of a new album mode or? Yeah, so this is still like the Spark That Moves has been out a year. Okay. So we're still getting to like, it's crazy because it's a year old and this is like, again, playing East Coast Canada for the first time on the album. Right. And then West Coast Canada is for the fall. Oh, cool. Like in September. Nice. Um, but it's cool because like we book everything ourselves now in Canada because mm-hmm. uh, it's a lot of like the same people we've been working with for like 13, 14 years. Because now you've got all the relationships, right? Yeah, lots of it like we book, like I mentioned, like Sean Scallon, like we're playing Ottawa on this mm-hmm. tour. Like I've known him since I was like 21 years old, Right. you know? So it's like, yeah, that's kind of how like the whole country is. Almost like the old man band now. A little bit and like in a way, like I'm definitely like really stoked to be that. Like, I'm, like, like it's cool, and there's a lot of people that are really, like, pumped on it, too, to be, like, oh, man, like, I haven't been to your show in five years. Like, I'm so stoked you're still doing it. You think that 16-year-old kid that sat behind the kit would have ever thought he would end up being a 40-year-old 40, 40 independent? That side, I feel like, is an interesting switch, because yeah. I think when I was, like, younger, there was no 40-year-olds playing music right. in this world. There was, like, old metal guys, Mm -hmm. but in, like, hardcore and punk, I feel like everyone has kind of, like, slowly grown into it. Mm -hmm. So, for us, like, we're, like, oh, yeah, but Converge is still doing it. Like, Clutch is, like, putting out better records now than they ever have. Right. It's, like, that kind of stuff. Like, Hatebreed is still killing it. It's, like, okay, well, there are better examples of, like, the old guy. It's not just, like, the you know, dumpy dad <laughs> who's like trying to relive his youth. Yeah, man. You know what I mean? And I think it was like now seeing like those, those kind of like examples that we can like, like, oh, okay, we'll just like model things after that. Converge is like a big band that we like model our business after. You still drawing kids, kids? We are. Uh, it depends on like where. Mm-hmm. We don't play all ages shows anymore though. Okay. So now like our kid kids are like 20 years old. Sure. Um, unless it's in the UK. So the UK is like a completely kind of different animal for us Mm -hmm. where we still get like, they have like magazines that like offer coverage for younger kids. Okay. You know, we play bigger festivals there where like young kids are there. Right. Like we still do, you know, like we'll support like bullet from a Valentine and like they have younger fans. So like we're still kind of in that. Kind of like it's great because it keeps you moving, right? Yeah, and it's awesome, and it's like you also you only have to be sixteen to go to a bar. Oh right, you know, so like yeah. there are like different cultural differences. Cultural right? differences. It's definitely like parents bring their kids, right? And that's like a very big thing that they've always done. The only show I've ever been to where I saw parents bringing their kids was always a punk rock show. And you go to any punk rock show, and there's always some fucking parent that brought their kids yeah. to it, and it th- I think it's great. 
I think it's great. I think I wish there was more of it. Uh, that happened like when we would do like Billy Talon and Alexis on Fire, like yeah. that stuff happens. Right. But uh, the UK is definitely like father daughter. So much father daughter. Really? Yeah. Father daughter wow. more than father son. Really? Yeah. And our shows That's are so probably awesome. like 50 50, like female and male. That's great though. For the most part, like I would say like 70% of the shows are like that. It's fucking killer. Yeah, it's the like the UK scene is like is doing great. That's awesome, man. Um Canada's still kicking it. Like it's definitely like second place for us right. like as far as like shows and like that's just like by the nature of it. That's like awesome. there's half as many people in Canada. Well, speaking of getting to shows, I know you got to show you. Yeah, to I just want to hang out. We I only scratched on 2009. I know. <laughs> but dude, it was such a pleasure meeting you, man. Yeah, I, dude. I, I wish you nothing really but the fun best. Hanging out. Next time you come around, or if we happen to hit each other on the road, let's do it again and figure out the rest. Yeah, of it, yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, man. Okay, so uh, that is this episode of the AVB podcast. Uh, as always, if you hit the description below, there'll be links for our guest, for us, and for all of our killer sponsors. Uh, we will see you next time. And there's a couple of videos, so stick around, click one of them, keep yeah. watching, hit subscribe and shit too. See you.